Hello everyone, it's a wonderful privilege for me today to be able to interview Nigel Ware and his mother is a key member of the church here at a, a Makaroa community church. So I get to interview Nigel today, just going to see how he came to the Lord and how God's used him on, on the mission field and different things. So enjoy today's testimony. So first of all, Nigel, I want to ask you how you became a Christian and how did that happen? In uh, 1980, I moved to um, uh, Taranaki, New Plymouth, and uh, I purchased an optometry practice. And uh, um, it was at that stage um, I was drawn into a local church, partly because uh, there was a lady who was a member of that church. Uh, her name's Carol. And uh, I came along and for about six months I just sat and listened to uh, the teacher who uh, was giving the sermons each Sunday and uh, he just really brought the Bible to life for me and uh, eventually I came to a place in May of 1983 of uh, giving my life to the Lord and receiving him into my heart and I was full immersion water baptized at that stage. Uh, I married Carol um, in 1985 in October and um, it was actually a year after that that my parents moved up to Makarora here in Tauranga and so I started coming up to the local church here two or three times a year as I caught up with my parents and uh, I got to know the uh, Makarora church, community church at that time and they have continued to attend uh, down through the years. I'd just like to ask you a few questions about your parents because I, I know your mum but I of course, I don't know your father, so yes. But did your father walk with the Lord, or what was the situation with your father? Yeah, my dad, Warwick Weir, um, he passed away in 2004, but um, he, for a long time, he was not really uh, committed to the Lord. Um, it was mainly mum that used to come to church, and uh, she'd been a churchgoer from her very early days because. My maternal grandfather was um, a, a, a preacher in the Anglican Church. He was a lay preacher and uh, he preached a lot uh, in different churches around Wellington and he was even in uh, uh, doing Sunday night um, messages on the local radio. So he was uh, quite a godly man, clearly. And, uh, but sadly he passed away in 2000, I mean, uh, when mum was nine years old, and um, her, her mum had also passed away prior to that. So mum was an orphan from about the age of nine onwards. But uh, she was remained committed to God and was regularly attending church. So mum was the main one that caused me to uh, develop a heart for God. Uh, but I didn't come to born again faith until I was 31 years old. But Dad, in his latter years, he started to be drawn into the church and he got involved in the um, building of the, this building that we're sitting in right now. And um, he, he actually has a plaque outside the, uh, the building uh, with his name and date of uh, death on it. So, uh, yeah, I'm just thankful that he, he came to a place of recognising who God was. and. Uh, and uh, walked with them in his latter years. I know your mother just got water baptised only a couple of years ago, so maybe you could tell us something about that as well. Yeah, quite some years ago I challenged Mum uh, to the fact that um, the baptism she'd received, which was christening, uh, uh, I said I didn't feel it was a, a genuine baptism that lined up with uh, biblical and scriptural terms of what a baptism involved, which was full immersion, and also that uh, it was not possible for a child to uh, go through the place of repentance and faith that uh, were the prerequisites for uh, water baptism. So um, she didn't really receive what I had to say, but um, it was just only about two years ago she finally came to a point of um, of recognising her need for full immersion water baptism. We, uh, we took her into the uh, swimming pool in the Makaroa retirement village and uh, 
gave her full immersion water baptism, which was something I was really blessed about. Well, we know every person that God calls for the mission field, they have a different story and a different way that God called them and led them. So I just want to ask you how God called you and led you into the missionary calling. Towards the end of the 1980s, um, uh, Carol and I did a missionary course. It was called Perspectives in World Missions. And uh, it really opened our eyes to the need of uh, missionaries going out to the foreign uh, mission field. And uh, the next year in 1990, we did a, um, a trip to Hong Kong and did some Bible careering. And uh, it was such an exciting time. And we really saw God's grace at that time. And uh, on our return flight back to New Zealand, um, I said to Carol, how would you feel if we sold uh, my business and availed ourselves for the foreign mission field? And to my surprise, she said, yes, let's give it a go. So um, my business sold very rapidly within a few months. Um, I was actually a, a little, I balked at it for a little bit. I wasn't quite sure, was this the right thing to do? It was quite a big step to uh, sell my business. But when I had sold it, it seemed like I'd passed a, almost a testing time before the Lord because I was uh, unhitching myself from something that was a so false refuge in my life. And um, soon after that, the Lord started to really give Carol and I some strong guidance as to where he wanted us to go. And it was a country called Uzbekistan, which uh, borders Afghanistan on the northern border. And at that point, uh, it was still a state under the Soviet Union. But uh, throughout the latter part of 1991, um, God just kept bringing this country, which I'd never heard of previously, uh, before Carol and I. Uh, we actually did a, a YWAM Crossroads DTS uh, in the middle of 1991, and uh, we heard about this country at, at that point then. Um, so. During 1991, I really um, sought the Lord. Did he really want us to go to that country? And uh, because it was a big decision and we, you know, a lot of sacrifice on our part to go there. And uh, by the end of 1991, he had really given us clear uh, guidance, or myself more than Carol. And I'd come to the place of deciding, yes, God wanted us in this country. And uh, eight months later, God also spoke to Carol in a miraculous way. And uh, by July 1993, uh, we flew into Tashkent, which is the capital of Uzbekistan. And uh, the reason we were going there, uh, visa-wise, was to work within a Christian eye hospital that was being set up by a British charitable trust called Vision International. And uh, we spent 12 months learning the Uzbek language. And then uh, for the next probably 18 months, two years, we worked in a team to procure a building. And uh, we found a, a five-story uh, building that had not been completed uh, because at the time uh, Uzbekistan became independent, uh, a lot of the infrastructure of the country collapsed because the Russians withdrew all of their people and a lot of other things. So it meant that uh, there were so many needs right across the board for Uzbekistan, including my own occupation. Uh, it's a country of about 20 million people and uh, you could have counted the number of optometrists probably on one hand for that populace. So this uh, eye hospital was uh, greatly needed for Uzbekistan. What, what was the spiritual state of Uzbekistan f for the church? Because being under communist and then... Exactly so, right. Good so question. How was the church going in that situation? That's a, a very good question. It's quite a profound question, actually. Um, when I first heard of this country, Uzbekistan, I um, had a look in a, um, in a book that was put out by Operation... Uh, mobilization. I think it was called Operation World. But um, I, I looked at Uzbekistan as to its spiritual status and how Christianity was happening there. And it was virtually a totally unreached country. Uh, I think you could have counted the number of Christian believers 
1990 on both hands and the, it was so small but um, at the time that uh, the window opened up for foreigners to come into this country which was uh, at the time of independence and onwards um, there was a very gradual growth of uh, of the church the local contextualized church um, and it was basically I believe because a lot of foreign people were coming in from the West just to support the country and there were Christians uh, you know, a big number of them and it was just the presence of uh, Christian believers that I believed uh, started to cause the local church to grow and um, I, while I was there in Uzbekistan uh, there was a verse uh, out of Genesis that really spoke to me it was how uh, God spoke to Abraham and told him to walk the length and the breadth of the land and it was almost like he was establishing a spiritual presence um, of himself in the, in the promised land and that uh, all of the foreign believers that were working in Uzbekistan were doing the same thing and so there was a, uh, an ongoing growth of the Uzbek church at that time and by the time Carol and I left, uh, the number had grown to about 4,000 Uzbek believers. And today I gather it's about 10,000 that is the size of the church. But it's a very different church from what we're, we know here in New Zealand. They're a bit like China. They're under uh, a lot of heavy persecution, both from the main religion, which is Islam, as well as the... Um, the governing authorities, it's a police state run by a dictator and uh, the, the fact that uh, the Soviet Union was um, totally ungodly and atheistic, um, that has still uh, basically infiltrated the thinking of the governing authorities. They just are totally godless in their outlook and uh, they're actually anti-Islam as well as uh, anti-Christian and there's been a lot of people thrown into prison, uh, both Muslim and Christian, because of their faith. Um, yeah, so that's the state of uh, Uzbekistan today. It's uh, an underground persecuted church, but it's growing like so many other persecuted churches around the world. Do you have any further desires for more missions trips somewhere, or how do you feel about that now? Yes, I do have desires for mission trips. Um, but it's been not really realistic because we've been uh, bringing Jonathan up in New Zealand. Uh, he's at a point where he's about to head off to Australia. He's our adopted son from Uzbekistan. But uh, I still very much have a, um, a heart for Central Asia, uh, especially the Uzbek people. When you've worked amongst them for seven years, God bonds you to the people. And uh, so I have really felt bonded to them. I'd, love to be involved in the growth of the church there but it's um it's still a a, a place that's persecuted and uh, foreigners draw a lot of attention so uh, it's not really possible to go into uzbekistan and be uh, an, a missionary as it were um yeah but there are surrounding countries that god could uh, possibly draw us to but uh, we've got a, a few other things on our plate at the moment that God's using us in. Um, so God would have to open up the doors to direct us there. Uh, but I still have a heart for that part of the world and the people there. You know, it might be interesting for you to know that um, uh, Uzbeks are part of a, a bigger group called Turkic people. They go right through Central Asia and the most... Um, Eastern uh, people group are the Uyghurs in uh, Western China and it's been so sad to see the persecution that's come upon them as a people. Uh, so many of them, as you might know, have been thrown into uh, these massive prison camps uh, under the, uh, the Chinese regime. And But the Uzbek language and the uh, Uyghur language are very similar. If you learn one of them, you can speak uh, to uh, the other people of the other language as well. You have an amazing story about the adoption of your son, so please tell us a little bit more about that. In the second season that we were in Uzbekistan, uh, we were approached by um, um, a couple that were part of the YWAM team, 
and they'd met this uh, Uzbek lady, she was only 17 years old, but she was uh, pregnant and uh, she was in a place of, um, of real anxiety, she didn't know what she was going to do about um, the child that she was going to have um, in a matter of probably six months at that stage. But um, anyway, she was um, had approached the local or the um, Christians that were in the YWAM team to ask for their help to solve the, the problem. And so, because Carol and I didn't have any children, um, they, this uh, other couple approached us and we felt to ask God to just say whether uh, he wanted us to adopt this Uzbek minor or not. And within 10 days of us putting that question to God, he spoke to us from his word uh, independently to Carol and to myself. So um, it was a bit of a rough ride I have to say, uh, the adoption process, um, but he came into our family when he was about five weeks old and um, he basically just lived with us um, from that point on. Um, the whole issue of putting through the paperwork was something I knew I had to apply myself to, but I didn't quite know what it involved. Uh, but eventually, when he was about six months old, I went into the American Embassy with a friend, and uh, with the purpose of asking, uh, how would I uh, sort out the uh, paperwork for this uh, adoption of an Uzbek minor? And uh, to my shock, the uh, diplomat that I was talking to uh, I didn't reveal the fact that we had a, a Uzbek minor living with us, I was just inquiring about it. But he said uh, uh, for a, uh, a foreigner to try and adopt an Uzbek minor uh, was something that was impossible effectively because there was no legislation in place uh, within you know, the government's legislation for a foreigner to adopt an Uzbek minor. So um, I was facing something that was basically impossible to do and uh, Carol and I were quite shocked but we, we just carried on with um, our adopted son Jonathan living with us and uh, as we approached his um, his one or first year of birth when he was one year old um, we felt to pray and fast for the situation and um, we actually prayed and fasted on the 13th, 14th and 15th of December in 1996 and uh, at that time I was reading through the uh, book of Esther and amazingly we, as we're reading it through, I think it's about the 8th chapter, we read about the f um, uh, festival of, um, oh, I can't remember the name of it, um, Purim, yeah, the Feast of Purim and um, it's actually is on those very dates, it's on the 13th, 14th and 15th of December that they have this feast and it's a victory feast uh, that relates to how the, um, the Israelites had victory over Haman and uh, those who were against him and um, so these, it was a total miracle as far as we are concerned that these dates coincided with the dates that we'd fasted and I just looked at it and I just felt God saying to my spirit that uh, God was going to give us victory over um, the crisis that we faced and not being able to organize adoption paperwork for Jonathan. And um, unbeknown to me and Carol, it was uh, not long after that that the French embassy had a, a member of the staff that decided they wanted to adopt a local Uzbek miner. And they had the ways and the means of introducing the French legislation to do with foreign adoption. And that was eventually done. And uh, with it, when Jonathan was between two and three years old, all of the legislation was in place. And from that point on, the door opened up for us to be able to uh, legally adopt Jonathan. And uh, we got in contact with the New Zealand uh, Foreign Affairs and they eventually sent a New Zealand passport over to us 
and uh, it wasn't long before Jonathan had a New Zealand passport and we were in a place where we could fly out of the country. So uh, yeah, we just saw God move a, uh, a mountain that we couldn't move um, and uh, he did it in a miraculous way. And there were lots of people that helped us along the way. One lady in particular who helped us with the paperwork that uh, we're very indebted to uh, for arranging that adoption for us. So you were able to bring up Jonathan in the teaching of Christ and how is he doing now? Sadly Jonathan's not walking with the Lord. Um, we regularly brought him to church um, right up to about the age of uh, 12 but um, he just never really um, embraced uh, the Lord in his heart and uh, we weren't going to continue to force him to come to church if he was against his will. So uh, he, in time he just decided not to attend church. And uh, although we love him and uh, desire the best for him, um, you know, we're just praying that he will come to faith at some point. But he's not walking with the Lord at this time. Well, we'll just pray and believe for Jonathan to come to the Lord. I'd love to say a prayer for him now. Lord, we just thank you for the mighty miracles you've done on behalf of Jonathan. So, Lord, let that sink into his heart that you have called him. And even today, through the testimony and the miracles that his parents have seen in going to the mission field, let that blessing come upon Jonathan. Lord, let him be drawn to you in Jesus' name. What advice would you give for anyone who feels a call of God to one of these difficult countries just to help them get prepared for the mission that would lay ahead? Well, the first step that I took, which I would recommend, is doing uh, the equivalent of Perspectives and World Missions. If you remember, I did that course at the end of the 1980s. It's no longer called that. It's called uh, Kairos Missions Course, I think it is. It's run here in uh, Tauranga. I think it's run at the um, Bethlehem Baptist Church. And uh, y the YWAM base here in Tauranga, I think they also run it as well. It's about a, um, I think it's a, about a 10 week or three month long course uh, of study. But um, it really prepares your heart for uh, the foreign mission field and gives you an understanding of why it's so important. Uh, to add to that, I would recommend uh, one or two short-term missions trips just to adapt oneself to being out in, in foreign countries. Um, I'd also, this might sound strange, but it's something that uh, God took me through in preparation for the foreign mission field, was um, that being detached from the false refuges that we have in our own country uh, as I said, my business was a, a false refuge and God kind of took me through a phase of detaching from it and shifting my trust from that false refuge to God himself. Um, and I, I actually work currently for an organization called Elijah House and um, they regularly pray for people uh, to come free of false refuges. Those are places of security um, and comfort outside of God himself. Uh, so yeah, that's now available for anybody that's considering going to the foreign mission field. Uh, you could get prayer ministry through uh, prayer ministers that uh, work with Elijah House. Um, another area um, would be just to seek God for real clarity of your call to the, uh, the country that he's put on your heart. Um, that's probably the most important but uh, the reason is that you, if you end up in that place of really knowing that God has called you to a particular people group, um, then you'll withstand any challenges that might come your way once you uh, hit the mission field because you know that you're in the place that God has planted you. And we were in that place. It was so strong, the uh, guidance that God gave us, that we, we knew at the... Uh, prior to going out onto the mission field, that if we didn't go, we were disobeying God. So uh, that's how clear his guidance was. Um, yeah, that was the only time I actually laid a fleece. Uh, a fleece is a seeking God for a yes or a no answer. And um, 
Yeah, and I have to say that um, having gone through that process, I, I recognise that laying a fleece was something that God orchestrates totally. Uh, because Gideon laid a fleece, and I used to think that he was the one that, that had made the decisions on that fleece. Um, but I, I realised after having experienced it myself that um, God orchestrates the whole thing. And uh, basically, that's when I got a, a yes answer from God to go to Uzbekistan. Having experienced so much um, clear guidance and just um, experiencing the miraculous hand of God during that seven year season on the foreign mission field, it's left a deep uh, impression on my heart as to how much foreign missions is so important to God. Uh, we can serve God in our own land, we were, you know, our own um, home, but the thing is, God has a deep desire to see uh, believers go out and into lands that have been untouched by the gospel. Uh, I'm strongly convinced of that, purely because of the amount of grace that Carol and I saw uh, on our own lives as we served him in the, for in the foreign field. And can I ask you to say a prayer, both for the people of that nation and also for God to continue to raise up other workers for the sake of the gospel in that nation? I would be tempted to uh, give you a prayer in Uzbek, but after about 20 years of having left the country, uh, all my Uzbek has evaporated. So I'll give you a prayer in English. And um, I'd just like to ask the Lord to um, open up the window of opportunity for foreigners to come into the country and continue to uh, be a Christian witness within Uzbekistan, because it has become a closed country. So Lord, I ask for you to open the windows for our foreign workers. And Lord, I also pray for um, the local church, the Uzbek believers. Lord, they are living in a country that uh, persecutes the Christian faith. And I ask for you to just strengthen the hearts uh, of all Christian believers amongst the Uzbek church, that they would stand strong in the face of uh, Christian persecution. And um, Lord, I also pray for a real unity amongst the uh, churches that, that are there. Obviously, they can't have large churches. They can only have uh, small underground, um, s small churches, micro churches. And uh, I just pray for a real unity, uh, a love of the brethren to be established amongst them all, that they would support each other and uh, that there would be no isolation of the Christian believers, but they would be part of a, a strong network of believers. Um, and Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to visit this country and to visit the local church and that you would move with uh, great power, with signs and wonders, that uh, the local people would recognize that uh, you are a God who moves in the miraculous and that um, the signs and wonders that would uh, come forth from the lives of Christians and the people they would touch would be a powerful demonstration as to your uh, greatness and your glory. I just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.